One of the oldest lessons we learn in life is never judge a book by its cover. And today's subject, I Kill Giants, is perhaps one of the good examples of that. I Kill Giants is a seven-issue image comic book series first published in July 2008 until January 2009, written by Deadpool writer Joe Kelly and drawn by J.M. Ken Nimura. It received a movie adaptation in 2017, directed by Danish filmmaker Anders Walters and produced by eight producers. Count them eight. Including Chris Columbus and Michael Barnathan, who produced the first three Harry Potter movies. A fact they like to point out. But as we learned from Fantastic Four, using producers as a marketing strategy does not mean a seal of quality. The screenplay was provided by Joe Kelly himself, making it another case of the original creator contributing directly with the adaptation. My first exposure to this comic was pretty simple. I was leaving the movies after watching a movie that I sadly can't remember what it was, and I saw the posters on the way out and it looked interesting. A little later I found out it's an adaptation of a comic, and as if it was Destiny, I found the comic by accident at a comic store and bought it at sight. Now I talked about not judging books by their cover, but what does that have to do with this comic or film? Simple. Read the title of the story and look at the covers. You are looking at this strange little bunny girl carrying a massive weapon and facing off a giant creature. The title is about fighting giants. It's easy to assume solely on this that you're looking at a fantasy action story about this bunny girl who battles giants like it's something out of Shadow of the Colossus or Attack on Titan. But like I said, don't judge the book by its cover. The story of I Kill Giants is not as simple as what it appears as. The story of I Kill Giants is about Barbara Thorson, a fifth grader with attitude. She's a nerd who lives in her own fantasies talking with fairies, always with her books, likes to wear animal ears, and she's a Dungeons and Dragons master. Despite being a nerd, she doesn't take crap from anyone. She talks back to the adults in a manner that makes her the right one and regularly meets the principal. She spits at her bullies and prides herself in being a giant killer, complete with a weapon she always carries with named Great War Hamel Kowaliski. But under her tough exterior, she is afraid of something. Going upstairs in her home. Whatever that is upstairs that keeps calling her name, she always gets too afraid to go there. Upstairs, there is something so scary she blocks its name when other people mention it. Since she's a social outcast, she doesn't have any friends to share her interest with, and she regularly meets the school counselor Mrs. Molia to discuss her problems. One girl, named Sophia, approaches her during her interesting activities and start to get close to each other. And while Barbara doesn't mind educating Sophia or anyone about the giants, she believes it's safer to her to not be her friend. Because as Barbara puts it, people close to me die. And in a typical friendship story, a misunderstanding happens when she accidentally punched Sophia in the face during a fight with resident bully Taylor, leading later to a bigger mess where she sees the harbingers of death are invading her town thanks to Taylor destroying her traps and getting beaten up so hard she was taken to her bedroom, placed upstairs in her house, meaning the place she's always afraid to go to. And as the story progresses, we find out what was wrong with Barbara all this time, or what she was afraid of in the entire story. Her mother was dying of cancer. Yes, the thing upstairs calling her name, the ghastly thing she saw outside her bedroom, it was her mother calling her to see before she passes on. And the giant she was obsessed with was death. Everyone in the story wanted her to turn off her delusions and to accept the harsh reality awaiting her, but it was too late for Barbara. She's not accepting any of this and continues her fight against her giants and prevent them from taking her mother away. The story reaches the climax of Barbara fighting Taylor, who got mad to the point of planning to personally murder Barbara, until... The real giant shows up. Oh, but it wasn't just a giant, it was a titan, the worst of all giants. And this time everyone can see it and it grabs Sophia and Taylor. 
and here where we see the giant killer and her warhammer in full glory. Barbara charges and strikes the titan claiming it will never have her mother. But the titan speaks revealing an unexpected turn of events. It didn't come for Barbara's mother. It came for Barbara. Of course Barbara was not having any of this. The titan is getting neither her or her mother and she struck the final blow where they both disappear. The following day news are reporting the island was hit by a storm but no mention of any giant creature attacking. But it informs the disappearance of one girl, Barbara, who was assumed missing for the time. Until she came back home all messy with Kovaleski behind her. And with Barbara returning, she needs to do one last thing, going upstairs and seeing her mother. Remembering the words spoken by the titan, to find joy in the living while the time is hers and not fear the end. And to deny joy is to deny life. To fear joy is to fear life. The titan released Barbara to see if she can embrace that joy and to abandon all her thoughts about death and escaping it and be a happier person in life. The titan did come to take Barbara's life, but it came to take her old life, the life of cynicism, isolation and escapist fantasies. And with Barbara's return, she came to embrace her new life and face her deepest fears. And with the passing of her mother, it was for Barbara to leave her old fantasies behind because she no longer need them. The story ends with Barbara taking one last look at the Titan, thanking it for its help, and closing the story with the following. We're going to be alright. We're stronger than we think. Going back to the subject of deceiving covers, this comic provides two takes on the matter. The first of course is the true nature of the story. The story wasn't about fighting little giants, it was about fighting fears manifested as giants. The fear of death, the fear of losing, and the fear of isolation. This wasn't a fantasy tale of a mighty hero figure in shining armor. This was about a broken child who alienated herself from her society by obsessing in fighting creatures only she believed to exist instead of acting like a child and have fun with friends and family. The second take here comes from the story itself. For her entire life, Barbara saw the giants as creatures of death and destruction and they will come to take her sick mother away from her. She had dedicated her time and interest in fighting the giants based on what she studied from books of mythologies and expected nothing but evil from them. But as revealed in the story, the titan that came to her didn't come to take her or her mother's life. It came to help Barbara and tell her to enjoy her life and move forward. I also noticed Barbara's personality and character arc may have been based on the five stages of grief, though not in the exact official order. Denial and isolation? Check. Anger? Check. Bargaining? Check. Depression? Check. Acceptance? Check. New readers, assuming I didn't ruin it for you, may be surprised on how the story went by. As I said, I thought this was that kind of fantasy tale until I went deeper and discovered the more philosophical take on moving forward instead of binding ourselves with our pain and fears. The comic is not a perfect masterpiece though. It still runs on several cliched characters and some dialogue can come a little bit corny with some dated references like what I assume is a Britney Spears reference here. Also the way Barbara keeps getting away from talking back to the adults without facing consequences might seem a little unbelievable, but if you took it as them giving her a break due to her mother's illness, then it comes a little more acceptable. The art by J.M. Ken Nimura is eye-catching. Despite it being in black and white, the characters and backgrounds are still defined well enough that nothing gets lost or blended within itself due to excellent shading placement. Character designs take some inspiration from manga but stylistic enough to still stand as a western comic instead of looking something like Mega Tokyo, and each of the main characters look distinctive and easy to tell and very expressive. In 2017, the live action adaptation of the comic was released at Toronto International Film Festival later to the public in 2018, and in one of these rare cases, it was positively received by both critics and audience. The reception was not high though. 
it was agreed the movie was just okay, not great. And that's my rating as well. It was an okay movie. And as per usual to adaptations, it was mostly faithful to the main story, with some questionable changes. The movie starts by showing us a giant. Yes, this is the first scene and one of the problems of the movie. So right off the bat, the movie confirms to us the existence of giants as opposed to the comic that left their appearance ambiguous and left most of it as illusionary faces in the air until the physical appearance of the Harbingers followed by the Titan. The comic played with the idea of the giant's existence to make us think it was all in Barbara's imagination, so this reveal and later scenes where Barbara is confronting it multiple times and having the Harbingers talk to her takes away the build up for the climax, even if they make for interesting action scenes. But at the same time, it removes the fairies and these other magical creatures seen here completely. While their existence in the comic is mostly superfluous to the story and don't add much, beside having Barbara someone to openly talk to, and this moment when she sees them dead as a sign, they mainly served the purpose of showing us that Barbara was indeed living in her own world with these imaginary creatures as her only friends and removing them from the movie removed the fantastical element of the story and made it more grounded. There was this moment when she opened her bag, but since the movie lacked similar moments, it felt a bit random. Barbara is played by Madison Wolf, who I think was decent for the part. She was okay as a social outcast character, but didn't portray the feisty part of the character well. Comic Barbara was energetic, speaks of her mind confidently, and she is not the kind to go without a fight. And she smiles a lot. Madison Wolf's portrayal was more stoic, restrained, and quiet, and not as confident sounding. Wow, that looks so cool. Yeah, that's it. Dark omens are totally cool. What does that mean? It means my life is about to get complicated. Again. One change that I'm on the fence about is changing her D&D circle from her playing with her brother and friends to just her being the player while the rest are playing Call of Duty. On one hand, it makes her even more isolated than how she is in the comic, which fits with her character arc, but at the same time, it takes away that despite her quirkiness, her family are still willing to play with her and they were really having fun doing so. For the rest of the main cast, you have Sydney Wade as Sophia, who was good in my opinion. The comic didn't specify where she is from, but the movie added that she moved from Leeds, England. Not sure if it was something in the script or because the actress is English, but still works here. But as far as portrayals, she did fine. Oh, that's interesting. I, uh, nice meeting you. You have a pretty name. And I like the way you talk. Thank you. And of course, you have big name star Zoe Saldana as Mrs. Molière, the school psychologist, who was a bit blind in the role, but maybe because I'm used to seeing her in action movies, so seeing a more normal Zoe Saldana was often. Barbara, I'm sorry. Sometimes I know I pushed you hard too soon, but it's only because I want to get to know you a little bit more. Okay? Okay, I'll go first. I wasn't always a school psychologist. Well, that would be impossible unless you were cloned from one. Then you have Rory Jackson as the bully Taylor. Okay, so before I saw the movie, I knew it'll tone down the bullying and child violence because these are touchy subjects. Barbara slapping Mrs. Molly was toned down to not hear the sound. <laughs> And later when Barbara accidentally hit Sophia, they changed it from friendly fire in a brawl to this little accent because she was going deep in her thoughts. Got any Phillies fans in the family? But man did they ruin Taylor in this. First off, Rory Jackson was not the best actress to depict the character. Comic Taylor is this huge girl with a presence that will intimidate anyone coming across her path and won't hesitate to use violence whenever she wants to, even at school. She comes close to be a slasher villain because she is that messed up. With that being said, why would you cast someone who looks like they could break their own hand if they punch something? Oh, she is tall, but she lacks the mass and aggressiveness. You look at her and you don't feel intimidated. You look at a high school comedy alpha bitch wannabe. There was only one brawl in the movie out of several from the comic, but it didn't even look convincing. Sorry. 
But that's not the only thing the movie didn't get right with. It also butchered her character development. As you recall, Taylor witnessed the Titan's arrival. She was there when it appeared and saw Barbara's battle with it. Following that, she recognized her strength and stopped her usual bullying tactics at school. And when you have this bully character getting hammered down a peg, it comes cathartic after all what she had done to Barbara in the entire story. Movie Taylor? Not only her scenes were heavily reduced so she wasn't around much to confront Barbara, but she wasn't available during the Titan attack. The last thing we see of her in the entire movie is giving a threat to Sophia after humiliating her at school and slamming the axe to a book and that's it. She doesn't come back and we don't get any resolution with her. That development for the comic? Not here. And I know it's weird that I'm dedicating this time to defend a cliche bully character, but it does annoy me to see character development of any kind being taken away. Regarding Barbara's mother, the movie also scaled down on Barbara's ordeal with her and we didn't get this nightmare few moment. The whispers and the shadow scene here were kept, but losing that horrible imagery took away some of the fears she had of going upstairs. And then we have the disappointment that is the Titan. Ignoring Taylor's absence from the showdown, this is possibly one of the most lackluster fights in cinema. The comic gave us this grand battle with Barbara pulling Kovaleski from her bag with grandeur and performing super powered feet dodging and smashing the Titan, making it a spectacular fight and a great payoff for the entire comic. In this movie, not only Kovaleski was put like it was a minor thing, but this is the entire battle. Yep, just one strike that doesn't look like to even hit the titan, and we can't do it defeated and drags Barbara to the sea after getting a second strike. The movie also skips the part where Barbara goes missing after the fight, so not only we don't get everybody's reflection on Barbara, but she doesn't get her bagels either. The first time I saw the movie, I thought it was okay despite the changes. Looking at it again with the comic side by side, it is still okay, but not as good as I saw it the first time. The issues I had with it remains the same, but some of them I got a bit more critical with. At the same time, there are other bits that I did like this time, like the giant attack in the train yard where we see Barbara fending herself using her traps. It's still an okay movie even without comparing it to the comic, and assuming the scores were based on just the movie without the comparison, then I think it's the appropriate score. Not terrible, not boring, but not great. Despite the changes it made, it kept the overall theme of Barbara avoiding her reality and searching for an enemy to kill, thinking it'll save her mother and overcoming the depression that follows. If you've never read it, I highly recommend checking out the comic and read it by yourself. Both the comic and movie are available at Comixology if you're interested to buy them. The comic is just 7 issues and you can read it in one setting if you've got the time. And who knows, you might enjoy the movie with it. This was Shinobi03, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Wait, how are three players playing at the same time on the same TV without split screen? Damn it Hollywood, can't you even make a simple Call of Duty game look right?